Welcome to the Momsiety Club podcast. I'm your host, Tori Levine, and I like to think that I can keep calm in a difficult situation based in my background in psychology and criminal justice. But when I had kids, I was constantly questioning if I was doing things right or how I was messing them up this time. Add in a child with a chronic illness and I found myself full of anxiety. Before my son's diagnosis, it felt like every minute was a ticking time bomb. Is now the time that we should go to the hospital? Are they going to tell me there's nothing wrong again? Or am I overthinking it? Sure, I was keeping it together mostly on the outside, but the overwhelm of staying strong for everyone else was constantly threatening to be too much and result in one of those locked in the bathroom for a quick ugly cry moments. You know what I mean. Momsiety is a real thing for every new parent, and when you add in a chronic illness, food allergy, or other challenging circumstances, it can become downright isolating. And that's why the Momsiety Club is here for you. Each week, we'll discuss all things motherhood, so join me and let's get rid of this momsiety together. Welcome to episode 26 of the Momsiety Club podcast. Um, If you noticed, if you've been listening for a little bit, the intro was a little different. And that is because as 2020 was coming to a close and we were headed into the new year, I, like many of you, reflected on the past year, thought about what I wanted for the new year, and looked at ways that I could use this fresh start to expand the Momsiety Club both the podcast and membership to help more moms directly one-on-one and also indirectly by being able to take a portion of proceeds and donate them to different charities and organizations that assist families, children um, with chronic illnesses and other medical conditions. So that is why you will hear and see that the first month of any new member is donated to the charity that is for that month. And right now it is the Children's Miracle Network. Uh, This was mentioned a few episodes back, but I'm very excited for a new area that will be Uh, part of the podcast this year. We're going to be discussing in different themed months, mothering a child with a chronic illness, food allergy or intolerance, or other disabilities. Before we jump into more of my story and why this new direction is near and dear to my heart, let me just say thank you for listening and connecting. Thank you. I love hearing from each of you, and whether you have listened from the very beginning or are new to listening, whenever you are ready to reach out and say hello, please do so. You can find me on social media at Momsiety Club, that's M-O-M-X-I-E-T-Y Club, or reach out via email, hello at MomsietyClub.com. This week, there is a free resource, a free download for you with listing some ways to reduce momsiety. You can find the link to that in the show notes, which contain links to free resources, other, which contain links to anything that's mentioned, as well as the links to this free resource, as well as others having to do with prenatal and postnatal exercise and other ways to help with momsiety. You can visit join.momsietyclub.com and click on the free resources to get that info. If you're already a member of the Momsiety Club email list, you already have access to the episode's freebies and past freebies via the link to the free resources page that you get in your email every week. If you are not yet on that list, you just sign up by accessing the free resources at join.momsietyclub.com to be automatically added to the list and stay updated on any future specials or new offerings from the Momsiety Club. And remember to hit the subscribes And remember to hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. That way you automatically get the newest episode downloaded right to your phone. And it also helps other people find the podcast. All right. From the time the Momsiety Club podcast was only an idea in January and February of 2020 until now, pretty much a full year later, 
we have been able to connect with so many wonderful moms and experts in different areas. We have learned that there are so many other moms feeling the same way during pregnancy, postpartum, and beyond that most of us would never have imagined had these moms not had the courage and vulnerability to share their stories. So I want to thank each and every one of you who has shared your story, listened, and reached out. Personally, I have grown in my own ability to handle anxiety by being vulnerable myself, talking more openly about anxiety and what that looks like for me, and by moving each week with members of the Anxiety Club in our weekly classes. I've come to realize that I had anxiety throughout life and my passion dancing was how I managed it unknowingly. This has been an opportunity to study more about movement and how it affects our brains to reduce anxiety and depression. I've reconnected with a part of myself that dances just out of being happy and hearing music just around the house. And all these things are my wish for you as well. To be able to find connection, feel less isolated, relaxed through movement, and ready to own and confront your anxiety so it doesn't own you. Over the next few weeks, you'll hear a bit more about my personal journey recognizing anxiety, as well as how mom's anxiety appeared completely differently after the birth of my first and second, and how I managed my, my anxiety during the time my oldest was sick and being diagnosed with a chronic illness. As I mentioned, I have now come to realize that I had anxiety for a lot of my life and just didn't realize it. I had a few stints with depression when I was younger, but much of it was all rooted in anxiety as the driving force. I was a dancer, and I didn't realize until a decade after I stopped dancing every day that dance was an amazing outlet that kept my anxiety at bay. In college, when I was dealing with some depression, my counselor always recommended I go to the gym, but it wasn't really something I was ever really motivated to do while depressed. You see, exercise was never something that really came easily to me because growing up, I I never considered that I exercised. I just danced every night of the week. <laughs> so um, do I have any other uh, fellow former dancers or athletes who kind of thought of it the same way? I'd love to hear your answer. Okay, we are going to jump around a little bit in time, but stay with me. It will all make sense in the end. (laughs) About a year before we decided to start trying to have a baby, I discussed wanting to train and become certified um, as a Pilates instructor. It was my thought for the future that it would be a way for me to have a flexible schedule and be able to be home with the kids before and after school. Turns out I got pregnant and postponed training until the following year. So we'll fast forward a little bit (laughs) more. Ruben was born at the end of June 2014. I was fortunate enough in my job as a caseworker for children and youth to have six months of maternity leave before I had to go back. And during that time, my husband and I decided that I would leave my job and stay home. He was working 12-hour shifts and going to law school at night on top of that, so childcare for our schedule was either unaffordable or it just didn't work with how our schedules would be. There were times when I would go to work and think I would be coming home at 3 p.m., and then I would have an emergency and not get home till 9 p.m., so yeah, would prove to be challenging with childcare. Um, I was what I like to say, first-time mom anxious after Reuben. The first few weeks, I would burst into tears randomly, especially any time I would think about being left alone with Reuben. We had an extremely difficult time with breastfeeding, and I felt like a failure, all caps, failure. And I felt like there was no way I would be able to feed him alone. Miraculously, after tongue and lip tie revisions, multiple lactation consultant visits, 
nipple shields, syringe feeding, bottle feeding, breast milk and spit up everywhere, (laughs) pumping at all hours, using a supplemental nursing system feeder, and what seemed like we needed eight hands to do to get Ruben all set up. Um, He latched on his own then at three weeks old, and I felt empowered, but I still needed support. A friend told me about a local mom's group, and it was actually run and facilitated by the hospital where I gave birth, and that is 100, 1,000% what I needed. I needed to be with other moms and hear that my worries and quote-unquote inabilities were the same as theirs. Talking to moms a few steps ahead of me was really helpful, and the realization of not being the only one with these questions, concerns, feeling lost was so helpful. Between one month and six months, my anxiety went up and down, but moms grew, and eventually other groups like library classes, swim classes, music, were what I look forward to, and I like to say moms group is what saved me. I adjusted my anxiety medication via my general practitioner, and things seemed to be manageable. Also, the ability to run to Babies R Us every few days was great. <laughs> Babies R Us, Toys R Us, come on. Couldn't you have just cleaned up your, your store a little bit so that you would still be here for us? Um, especially us without, you know, other big baby stores around. Uh, but I digress. But it gave me something to go out for, even if we were just getting a, you know, thing of wipes. It was something to make the day seem like I accomplished something other than keeping a human alive. And if you have had a baby during the pandemic, there is a free resource and there is a past episode all about things you can ask for and ways you can help new moms from a distance. When Ruben was about four months old, Um, I got to attend a bar instructor certification, and I absolutely loved reconnecting to the bar, how I felt strong or that I was getting stronger, and moving to the music. I immediately wanted to teach, but I said I would have to have my little guy, quote, strapped to me (laughs) in a baby carrier. And I was actually able to teach some mommy and me bar classes. And when I started talking about them online and talking with them, talking about them with more and more moms, tons of people wanted to take part. So from that, Babies at the Bar was born. And with the focus of creating a weekly class where moms could come with their babies and toddlers and connect to other moms, feel like they were getting some time for themselves without having to pay for a sitter, and also getting stronger from the inside out, moms told me that they left classes less anxious, more relaxed, feeling a sense of community, and having fun moving and bonding with their baby in a different way than they would usually. And we worked on core and pelvic floor strength to regain all of those, all the function from having a baby and being pregnant. And then also I continued on with my Pilates instructor certification and began teaching with Ruben in the carrier or sitting and playing in the studio. So that was fun. And I do attribute a lot of that exercise and movement that I was doing. Um, Additionally, having a summer baby was really nice because I could walk all the time no matter what. Um, But I attribute a lot of that movement to helping with my anxiety now, looking back at it. And over time, with Babies at the Bar, a true community formed from these classes. Mom stayed in touch between classes. It was a joy and still is a joy to see these little ones getting bigger from class to class and beyond. During the time that I was teaching regularly at one location, I was also doing some other business stuff elsewhere, Um, but this one location was really great with the community that community that was formed and uh, what we were able to do there. But Ruben had started having some health issues. Uh, From the day he was born, he had a lot of spit-up issues. Over time, he was put on medicine, and then when his spit-up still continued, 
we trialed cutting out dairy and soy after the doctor did one of the uh, microscopic blood tests for that and found that in his stool. And after taking dairy and soy, he did well. There were no more, <laughs> no more baby spit up all over the place, or at least the amount had really reduced. We did all the allergy testing for food allergies, but since they were non-IgE mediated, nothing showed up on the tests. We also found that he had an intolerance to gluten, but that actually didn't present until he started solid foods. So I guess that was a plus, uh, at least for me, because then I didn't have to cut out another food that basically my, my diet consisted of. Uh, looking back at his growth chart now, we now know that around 18 months he began having issues where he was not absorbing nutrients properly. We began noticing some issues around that around the time that he turned two. He would barely eat, which was not something new. It was always hard to get him to eat, but he would say that he ate too much and get upset. In February of 2017, when he was two and a half, there were all of a sudden instances of bright red blood and blood clots in his stool. The first time I saw it, I called the doctor's office immediately. I called their on-call line and spoke with them. And the nurse told me that it was normal and to see, to see red blood, especially when a toddler has constipation. I reiterated that this was not constipation and called back again to get him seen. This is where some of the story goes south. His pediatrician had just had a baby and was out on maternity leave. So after seeing one doctor who passed it off as toddler constipation, we chalked it up to any time there was blood that he must have accidentally had gluten um, because the gluten on top of a rash uh, caused some GI distress which coincidentally did happen a few times when things had not been properly labeled for the nanny. Um, But when we continued seeing blood and the instances of him saying he ate too much happened more often, we again went to the doctor and again it was passed off as toddler constipation. And I was told kids can be constipated even if they're having diarrhea. Well... In May of that year, the pain began happening more often, and at a community event, we ran into a pediatrician, and I was that person, I have in quotes, uh, and went up and asked him what he thought and if we should make an appointment with a GI, and basically asked him if what our pediatrician's office was telling us was correct. Now, the pain wasn't just after meals by now. Um, There were actually a few days over the course of a few weeks when all I could do was cuddle him on the couch as he curled his knees into his chest and cried that he hurt and he just needed mommy. Um, I called the doctor's offices again and made another appointment, um, this time for next Monday, which was May 8th at that time. And I forgot to mention, I had also taken him to see his allergist to see if some of this was allergy related. Well, I called the doctor's office again and made another appointment for Monday, May 8th, because that was the first day his pediatrician was back from maternity to leave. And I said I wanted to see her. And so the following week, we scheduled with her. I have to mention as a little tangent, that at this point when I was writing uh, this story is when I got the pit in my stomach of remembering the things because this time period was just so upsetting. And also it's really upsetting to look back at just because of kind of things not being looked at as to how they were supposed to be looked at and, you know, all those what ifs. But All right, back to the story. Uh, On May 7th, uh, 2017, and I do remember the date because (laughs) um, I I just remember a lot of the details about it. We were attending a Maccabees concert where um, he was having a good time and the concert was almost over. And then all of a sudden he started getting upset and really 
yelling and said that he had to go to the bathroom and I took him and only blood and mucus came out and he was so upset and just kept saying, I ate too much, I ate too much. And all I could do was hold him while like holding him on the potty because he's a teeny, he was a teeny little two-year-old um, saying like, I know, I know, I'm sorry, mommy's here, mommy's here. Well, I went back in because I, I told Ruben, I said, we have to go back in. And he re- he was, you know, really upset. He wanted just to go home. And I just said, we have to go back in to get daddy. And when we went back in, I had no idea what to do. Isaac and I were just there talking and saying, like, we need to go to the hospital or, you know, what is this? This is not normal after he's had all these episodes. But then other times when he had episodes like that, it would last for just a little bit, hours, and then he would be okay. So it was kind of like, do we have to wait this out? And while we were having this, you know, what do we do discussion, um, two rows in front of us happened to be a local pediatric GI. uh, And his wife and I had been on a board together, but we were, and we were, we were members of the same synagogue. But other than that, we really didn't know each other. But my anxiety again kicked in and I was worried. Like I was told Isaac, I said, I know he's a pediatric GI. And um, Isaac said, so go talk to them if you know them. And I said, well, I don't. And it was this back and forth. And then I think more so anything, which is the sad part here, is I had an anxiety attack about interrupting their family time and going and talking to them and asking a question. So that's where my brain was on top of everything else. But so again, I was worried about accosting the doctor and asking for advice while he was out at a community event with his family. My heart was pounding and I didn't know if it was out of worry or fear of being labeled as that paranoid mom. But because throughout Ruben's infancy. Anytime I called the doctor, I was always, or didn't call the doctor, I was always worried of them just labeling me as that, you know, anxious first-time mom. Um, And while I'm still on a tangent about that, (laughs) you know, so what? So what? You have to advocate for your child. And you are not a medical doctor, unless you are. But still, it's really different when you're dealing with your own child um, as opposed to when you're dealing with somebody else's child that you can like kind of remove the emotions from and be objective. Okay, so at the end of the concert, I walked up really quickly. Ruben was still in my arms, you know, trying to pull his knees up to his chest, um, trying not to be yelling and just like kind of I don't know how to explain it, but just like all curled up in my arms. And I just really quickly explained that Reuben was having blood in his stool and stomach pain and it was getting worse and it had never been worse than at that exact moment. And I asked if we were to take him to an ER, should we go to Pinnacle or should we go to Hershey? But I also said that he had a doctor's appointment the next day. So should we even consider that. And since most of the times these things resolve themselves within a few hours, were we okay to wait till then? And here is where, you know, the details get a bit mixed up for me, but because of everything that was going on, but I'm pretty sure that the doctor gave me like his card with his info because he happened to be the on-call pediatric GI um, at that for that week. Um, and also he said, you know, he couldn't tell me anything without a full exam in history, which I totally understood. And I just remember, I think my biggest concern was like, if we go to the ER, are they going to look at him or are they just going to say he's fine, you know? And then we would have put him through this unnecessary trauma of going to the ER and whatever else. It was it was that type of anxiety. Well, despite my anxieties and hesitations with going to the ER, I was ready to go to the ER and just deal with it. But then my husband kind of talked, we talked it through and thought that Ruben needed 
you know, just some fluids. Maybe he hadn't had enough to drink that day. Um, and if he was not better in a few hours, we would definitely go to the ER after giving him fluid and everything. Well, we went home and we were able to get him to keep drinking and rest while we watched a movie and he was doing better than that evening. And a little side note, he still remembers this, but not in a bad way. He remembers that we had a pull-out sofa at our old house and pulled it out so that we could all lay down or sit together and snuggle and watch a movie. He actually says he wishes we had that pull-out couch again because he wants to do that. So it really shows you how resilient kids are. All right, so he he was kind of back to his normal self then. So Monday, we went to his pediatrician's appointment, and she was actually concerned and wanted to test things. Um, she did a little toe prick to check his hemoglobin, and we discussed her referring us to Hershey Pediatric GI since without a referral, when I had called them previously, we were looking at an appointment in six months, which would have been December of that year or the next year. And even with a referral, they had told me that the wait time was three months. So after hearing all of that, I had set up an appointment at CHOP, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, their GI, um, just because um, I was able to get an appointment in less than three months there. (laughs) Um, And I didn't need a referral. So his pediatrician told me to keep that appointment, but he would hopefully be able to get into Hershey prior if there was an issue. Um, So the quick prick blood test showed his hemoglobin was low and his pediatrician talked to me about, you know, the level where it should be, where his was and what that meant and that she wanted to send us for further lab work. Again, here my memory gets a little bit wishy-washy with how things lined up in the timeline, but um, I know I gave the pediatrician, you know, I told the pediatrician what the on-call GI told me the, the day before at the end of the concert. And for the pediatrician to call, talk to the on-call GI if Ruben needed to be seen. So, his pediatrician said, yeah, he needs to be seen. So after the appointment, I think she called there as well as the GI's wife who I had been on the board with, um, kind of like texted me a couple questions from her husband, I think. I don't know. There was lots of moving pieces, (laughs) but, um, then The pediatrician called, said she referred, the GI was going to call, and Hershey GI's office then called me and was able and had an emergency spot open up within the next week or two um, with an on-call doctor. Um, So this is actually a a different doctor, but it was the on-call doctor of that week, and they always keep some spots open for emergencies and people who need to be seen right away and can't wait. So we were thankfully, thankfully able to get that appointment. So while we were waiting those few weeks, I, of course, went down all the things that could possibly be and like convinced myself I knew what it was um, and just couldn't wait for the weeks to be over so he could have this appointment at the pediatric GI office. And so I remember walking in there and the doctor being amazing, number one, listening to every single detail, wanting to know those fine, minute details. And um, basically then he told us he didn't sugarcoat. He didn't like doomsday it up, but he told us every single thing that it could possibly be. And the final thing that it could possibly be was very early onset inflammatory bowel disease. And he even said, I don't think that's what it is. That normally happens when kids are much older. In the 10 years I've been practicing, I've had one child who has, who had 
Crohn's or ulcerative colitis, and I referred them down to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia for their very early onset inflammatory bowel disease clinic because they specialize in it there. And I actually, I just remember, I don't even know if I said it out loud, but I was just like, well, Ruben's going to be your second one. I just know it. So I'm going to end here for this part of the story and we'll cover more of the diagnosis and, you know, the anxiety. And then after diagnosis, worrying about all the anxieties of, are we going to freak out anytime there's an issue with him not eating or how do we handle this? What does this mean medication wise and for his childhood and life and so on. So there's a lot (laughs) that goes into that as well. And that will be discussed next week. I do want to mention, because I was talking about the community formed from Babies at the Bar classes, that while this started, this like kind of like how is Ruben doing and not knowing what's going on and then further on into the phases of diagnosis, um, while that community was there for everybody else and I was there helping new mothers along, they they were there so much for me and I want to thank every single one of them. The, the funny thing is sometimes those of us who enjoy helping others sometimes have a pretty hard time helping ourselves or implementing it on ourselves. So if you are one of those people who knows what I'm talking about, if you are one of those people who is a helper but really has a hard time helping themselves, giving them self-care, please reach out. Reach out on social media at Momsiety Club email me hello at momsietyclub.com because I would be honored to assist you in kind of walking down that path of where I've been and where I have come as well as many other moms in finding, you know, what you need to do to help yourself. And so that is part of the Momsiety Club, no matter where you are in your journey, hard is hard. My uh, counselor actually recently um, recommended a TED or TEDx talk about hard is hard. You know, we need to stop comparing that, you know, your hard is harder than my hard and those types of um, comparisons because at the end of the day, if you had a hard day, you had a hard day. At the end of the day, if I had a hard day, I had a hard day. And we can come together and support each other through whatever hard means to each of us. And that is what moms do inside of the Momsiety Club membership and also That is what we use movement for as well, to help ourselves um, disconnect from the anxiety, from the worries, do something for ourselves, and um, heal from the inside out and outside in. All right, Mama, I would love to connect with you either on social media or via email. And you can also leave a voicemail there. Click the little leave a voicemail button at join.momsietyclub.com. If you have a story to share, please reach out. And also, if you know somebody who would benefit from this podcast, a new mom or mom of a child with a chronic illness or facing other challenges, please share this with them because knowing you are not alone can mean everything some days and being able to have that safe place to share your story and hear the stories of others, again, can be that community that you didn't even know you needed. All right, Mama, thank you for listening. Remember to subscribe in your favorite podcast app and to get the free download of ways to help with momsiety, head to join.momsietyclub.com and sign up for the free resources. Next week, we're going to really dive into the diagnosis and anxieties that went along with that and how I managed them. And then finally, after the week after that, we are going to discuss momsiety 
after having a second child because boy did that one throw me for a loop. All right, mama, let's move and get rid of this momsiety. The Momsiety Club podcast is not intended to take place of medical advice or therapy. If you are in crisis, call your local emergency number or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. The Momsiety Club membership is full of a group of amazingly supportive moms and pre- and postnatal fitness tips and exercises to help you mentally and physically. The first month's fee for all new members this month is being donated to the Children's Miracle Network. When you're ready to join other mamas getting through the ups, downs, and anxieties of motherhood, head to join.momsietyclub.com to become a member and check out the Ultimate Momsiety Relief Package.